I'm going to welcome everybody to uh, the first issue, the first installment of Apiculture Online for the calendar year of 2021. Um, thanks, everybody who's joining us on our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to our channel and, and comment away on the, on the chat function during this live stream. Um, and we uh, are really happy to, to continue this. Unfortunately, this was all started because of COVID and, and the, the pandemic, but I think this is still just a great way to be able to, to link up with other beekeepers online, even though many people may be getting kind of tired of Zoom and, and this kind of format, but it's still, I think, a lot better than just kind of being in a vacuum and not talking with, with each other about bees and beekeeping. We have a really great um, lineup this evening. Uh, before we begin though, I'm just gonna share my screen. And I just want to make an, a, a couple of quick announcements here. Um, first and foremost, last year when we kind of started this Apiculture Online webinar, we were doing it every other week uh, because we really wanted to fill that void because a lot of things um, were just kind of abandoned and there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity to, to talk about beekeeping um, you know, because of that. But I think a lot of people have picked up, a lot of clubs have, have moved online and doing other things. And as I said before, a lot of Zoom burnout. Um, so we're actually moving this to a monthly format. So from, from going forward for 2021, um, we're gonna have it at the last Wednesday of every month or at least eat most every month. Um, and so we're just going to have uh, Apiculture Online just once a month. So, just, uh, so you can put that down on your calendars. Again, we'll be putting the announcements out um, kind of the week prior and the day of, of the Apiculture Online. So um, keep tabs on our, on our website as well. I also want to mention um, kind of two other things that are going to be online that um, just like last year, we're gonna be, revive our uh, online beginner bees school. So bees of course is our uh, beekeeper education and engagement system that we've had online for a good 10 years now of these online asynchronous classes that you can kind of take at your own pace. Now, just to be very, very clear, um, we are not trying to compete with or substitute any of the online B schools that are already out there and being offered and, and some of which are already ongoing. Um, those are all uh, great and you definitely want to uh, and encourage to take your local B school um, from your local chapter and to interface with your local beekeeper community. But if you can't make their meeting nights or if it's just not convenient or you'd rather kind of do it at, at your own pace, we actually have um, two alternative options uh, just in case that might suit you better. So we actually have um, our, our three beginner uh, classes that constitutes about six and a half hours of total online content. Um, you can enroll right now and uh, take it at your own leisure, at your own pace, starting February 10th. But then on February 17th, we'll have um, an additional Zoom meeting with, with everybody in that online B school. So you can interface with us and ask questions and we can have a live discussion, much like we are right now. Um, if you would rather take a live uh, version of that, we're also going to be offering on March 13th, which is a Saturday, we're going to um, have a live version of this where we will be hosting it through Zoom and then watching all of the recorded content on the Bees Network together and then have immediate um, Q&A during, um, during that that session. So that's kind of a, a full day on a Saturday, uh, but then there's also the, the self-paced one. So if you're interested in that, check out our website um, and uh, certainly have that as an option. But again, it's, it's only for those that would prefer that type of format rather than your traditional B school, which we definitely encourage. Um, one last quick announcement is that we've tentatively scheduled um, our Intermediate Bees Academy for uh, August, uh, late August in Monroe um, and in, in Union County. And uh, just like we did in 2019, we were unable to do that. Well, we did one in 2020 before the uh, everything shut down. But these are two day, very intensive 
uh, live trainings at cooperative extension uh, centers in, in collaboration with uh, um, cooperative extension agents where we, uh, we treat it like a booster shot to your beginner bee school. A lot of beekeepers, you know, took their beginner bee school. They've been keeping bees for one or two years. And we think that this is a really good training for, you know, to, to remember those things that you learned in B school and then go kind of one step further to try to reinforce a lot of those things. Um, and so definitely uh, keep tabs on that or at least uh, tentatively keep those dates on your calendar if you are interested and in, uh, in, in that particular area. So anyway, um, to go on with our typical four segments of the Apiculture Online, we'll start out with our bees in season. Uh, and this is a, a segment where we talk about what your bees are doing right now biologically, and then what you should be doing as a beekeeper to assist them in whatever they're doing right now. And so as of right now, in late January, at least in North Carolina and, and regionally, um, it is winter, the bees are not in hibernation, they're not asleep, they're certainly you know, in there still active and they're clustering in order to, to conserve heat and to make it through the, the dearth because there's nothing for them to, you know, to forage on really out there right now for the, for the most part. And so as a result, they want to conserve heat. And so you don't want to get too nosy and uh, crack open the, uh, the hive bodies uh, because that might break the propolis seals. Um, if it's if it's warm enough and the propolis can kind of reseal itself, then it's okay to crack the lid and and look in there when it's warm out. Uh, but if the forecast is cold weather, you just kind of want to trust in the bees and, and let them kind of stay in that kind of semi-fragile state. Um, this is also a great time, of course, to catch up on your beekeeping chores uh, building woodenware and new equipment and, and those kind of things. Um, one of our recorded apiculture onlines from, from last year, we're going over a lot of those things that you can do because spring will be here before you know it. So, you know, don't be that beekeeper that puts things off and then you're kind of building frames while you're trying to hive up a swarm, you know? So um, make sure you uh, are, are ahead, of, ahead of your chores in that way. Um, right now, as I said, the bees are clustering and they're kind of moving slowly as a cluster through that brood nest, consuming the honey. So hopefully, you know, you've left uh, the bees with enough uh, honey stores and they had a, a sizable enough cluster where they're able to go in and, and consume that honey in order to uh, generate the heat and, and to keep going until next spring when, when things start blooming again. But uh, I'd like to just quickly touch on the issue of making plans if you need new bees for next year. If you only had one hive and it died off this winter and you're planning on getting a new one, if you're a new beekeeper and you've never had bees before, right now is the time that you need to start thinking about where you're going to get your bees from. So let's talk a little bit about the different options that are out there for you. Uh, in order to, you know, create new colonies next year, either new or uh, growing the number of colonies that you have. So I think the best way to increase uh, the number of, of bees is to create your own. So if you're overwintering some colonies, then next spring you make splits and you're able to, to make your own um, kind of nukes and, and, and kind of increase the number of, of managed beehives that you have. Um, if you aren't overwintering your own hives and you're not able to, uh, to increase your numbers yourself, um, you can purchase local nukes. So that's kind of the number one recommended way of purchasing bees from others. Um, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of that over here on the right in a second. Um, if, you're, if you don't purchase your local nukes, um, Jennifer and I were talking the other day about um, kind of a missed opportunity for clubs to come together and have kind of a, a split sharing program or having a field day where beekeepers, existing beekeepers can reduce the swarming tendency of their overwintered colonies, but then also provide those splits to new beekeepers so that they can start up with, with some local, um, local colonies that way. 
Uh, a fourth way to do it, of course, is through uh, purchasing packages. And pa <coughs> excuse me, packages are um, uh, bees without the the comb <coughs> or any of the the stored food. And then the last and probably least reliable way. of starting a new colony is to catch swarms from, from uh, out in nature. So here are just some pictures of that. So uh, making or purchasing local nukes, these are usually sold in five frames, right? So a <clears throat> typical Langstroth beehive has 10 frames. Um, and so if you can go and you can find a beekeeper that is selling local nukes, <clears throat> they provide you with five frames with the bees on it, a laying queen, <clears throat> brood of all stages and stored honey. So it's in essence, it's an established mini colony. And so uh, all you have to do then is transfer those frames into your own equipment. So put those five frames into a 10 frame, you know, empty box and those, you know, colonies will, will really start growing. They have a really, really, you know, good head start. <clears throat> the supply of local nukes is, is, tends to be quite low. There's a real bottleneck in providing local nukes because each nuke needs a queen and producing queens, especially very early in the season is, is very, very difficult to do. Um, locally. And so I think you need to really think ahead and shop around and um, try to um, to secure uh, somebody who is able and willing to, to provide some, some local nukes. Uh, we'll talk later with Don Hopkins from the NCDA talking about the authorized dealers and vendors who are, um, are uh, registered in order to provide those, not giving any names, but just the, the process by which they, um, they need to register for that. Uh, purchasing packages. So this is what a, a honeybee package looks like. So it's three pounds of adult uh, bees with a queen in a cage. That's about 10,000 or so uh, workers. And what uh, one does is purchase that and then um, sh literally shake the bees out of that package like packing peanuts, right, into a, uh, a hive and they'll very quickly take up residence. The same can be done with catching swarms that you might be able to just find in nature. But again, um, that's uh, kind of rolling the dice and there's certainly no guarantee that you're, you'll uh, ever run across a swarm. But the pros and cons for this, we always recommend that starting with nukes is preferable, even though they might be pricier, um, they, and their supply is, is pretty, pretty um, kind of difficult for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, their, their quality is high. The, the risk of kind of failure of that colony is, is a little bit low because it's already an established colony. All it needs to do is just grow, right? So the buildup and the survival is very rapid and very good compared to packages where the buildup is slower because even if the queen starts laying right away, it still takes three weeks for those first um, bees to start emerging and for them to grow up. So um, starting uh, colonies from packages is a little bit slower. And the goal is to just have that colony build up so that they have enough honey to survive next winter. You're not going to make, you're really uh, unlikely to make a honey crop um, this year if you start bees from a package. And again, swarms, even though they may be free for the most part, um, it's very variable and, and uh, the quality can be, can be low as well. <clears throat> so I want to get back to this last idea about having some sort of field day with your local club. Again, this is something that can be a real win-win when it comes to um, swarm prevention of existing colonies, right, during kind of the height of spring. So to prevent the bees from swarming, a great way to do that is to make a split from that, from that colony. Then they're kind of already swarmed themselves, right? So it helps the existing beekeeper out, but then it's also a great way to have the practice of how to make the split and then taking the split and then hiving that up in, in your own operation. 
the limitation of that and then indeed of making your own splits within your own operation is you need a source of queens. Um, so again, it can be really, really difficult for the timing to make your own queens and then to use them in your own splits. But I think with a little bit of coordination, a little bit of forethought, clubs can go in and they can buy, you know, 20, 50, whatever queens uh, for the club. And then as they're in this field day, they're making splits and then uh, requeening those queenless splits with these new queens that were purchased. It would be a really uh, good way, it'd be a good learning experience and a really good way to disseminate um, kind of local nukes among the, the club members, especially among the new club members, um, while abating swarming of the existing colonies from which they're made. And so definitely if you have any questions or, or uh, comments about that, um, just let us know or just uh, email us and happy to, to help uh, not coordinate it. That's something you can do at the local level, but certainly um, kind of spitball ideas or, or ways to, to sidestep landmines. So uh, without any further ado, oh, sorry, I'll just kind of wrap up very quickly in saying that um, one of the things that as beekeepers you really want to do is you want to look one to two brood cycles ahead. Um, so that's, you know, a brood cycle is three weeks. So that's, you know, a good three to six weeks from now. Um, what should you be doing? Uh, what will the bees be doing so that you can do those things now? Well, at that point, they're going to be brooding up uh, significantly. They're really going to be ramping up and accelerating their, their, their um, colony population growth. Um, but because of that, it's also a pretty tenuous time, kind of that transition from winter to early spring can be really tough because they're brooding up, they're going through all their honey stores, but that spring flow might not be on yet where they're not getting a lot of nectar and pollen. And so their, their uh, kind of food pantry may be running out really quickly. So that's a great time to, to make sure that the bees don't kind of accidentally starve to death because they're brooding up so quickly. So that's something definitely to, to be on the lookout and future apiculture online we'll be talking about um, that uh, specific issue. And so with that, I want to make sure that I turn things over to our apiculture technician at NC State, uh, is Jennifer Keller. And she's going to take the second segment here and the timely topic about checking your hives during the winter and, and things that uh, you should do and things that you should avoid. And I'll stop the sharing so that she can do, uh, do the same. Uh, Jen, I think you're, you're muted. And I'm on the wrong slide. How do I get? I think hit, hit um, the back arrow key. It's not, it's not allowing me to. There. Okay, there we go. Thank you. And thank you for that great segue because you led right into what I'm talking about. So it was perfect. Uh, yeah, I was trying to think of what can we talk about for winter management? Because winter is not all that exciting time of year. There's not much going on. And really about the only thing going on in the bee yard is feeding. Uh, if our bees don't have enough stored honey, they might need our help and we might have to supply some extra food. And in this case, when I'm talking about feeding, I'm talking about sugar water only. I don't know that much about the fondants and the solid blocks of sugar. So when I say feed, I mean sugar water. Um, I'm not knocking the other ones. I just don't know that much about them. But we often have to give them a little bit of extra to get them through that period when spring arrives and we don't have to worry about them any longer. But I want to talk about the importance to understand First of all, why we need to feed, and then also when we need to feed, which includes in that statement uh, when not to feed, which I think is also as important. So I often hear beekeepers talking about, you know, just always feeding, 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 feeding. They, they put sugar water out in the feeder, it's empty the next day, so they fill it back up because obviously the bees used it all up and it's gone, so they need more. Well, if we remember, Bees collect food and then they store it somewhere. 
So just because the feeder is empty doesn't mean that they ate it all. They just stored it away for when they need it. So just because the feeder is empty doesn't mean you need to refill it. Uh, there are ways to check. You may need to fill it, but we need to go through a little bit more of a process to figure that out. But uh, the takeaway there is we, I don't want to overfeed my colonies because that can also cause problems just as bad as starving. Number one, the hive, the hive could become honey bound, in which case the like where the queen is supposed to be laying eggs, if they get fed too much honey, the, the bees are going to put honey in that space so the queen has nowhere to lay. And then when the population is supposed to be increasing, it can't increase because she has nowhere to lay eggs. Another problem that could occur if you have too much feeding occurring, too much honey, too, much, uh, too many honey frames, as opposed to how many bees there are. The population and the stores of honey aren't in a proportion that the bees agree with, then that, that might be a problem for small hive beetles to start taking over. Bees can't guard all those frames and the bee, beetles can easily start laying eggs and then the larvae feeding and that just causes a mess and eventually the bees will get run out of there. Um, and just on a side note, this is also true with pollen. Uh, I'm really only referring to uh, sugar water here, but if we feed too much pollen, the same problem with small hive beetles can happen. And so if you're going to use pollen, use a very small amount. But really, truly, this time of year, bees are on warm days, whenever it's warm enough for bees to be flying, at least in my part of the state, they're, they're always bringing in pollen. And from here on out, as soon as the maples bloom, which will be any day now, it's, pollen will not be a problem. It's, it's really just the sugar water. Okay, next slide. So, so now that we know kind of how we need to feed and what we need to feed, how do I know if I really do need to feed or if I, if I feed will my hives be have too much honey? So I just wanted to kind of fill in what's going on out in the bee yard right now in your hives. Like David mentioned, it's a little too cold still to be doing inspection. So we can't go in there and, and pull up the frames to see how many frames of honey there are. But this is a typical frame about this time of year. This would be about the third or fourth from the center of the brood nest. It, this had full honey weeks ago, maybe even like one week ago, possibly. And the, the honey stores are being consumed. So remember, the queen is starting to lay more eggs now. Thus, the brood nest is getting bigger. More bees equals more mouths to feed, so more consumption of honey. So your honey stores are going to be decreasing. And as the honey is, is removed, the bees are consuming it and they're cleaning out the cells as they go. They're polishing them up and getting them ready for the queen to lay eggs. So this is a picture of a typical frame this time of year. So it's really nice, except for the queen cups on there. And those are old, they're not new, it's nothing to worry about. Uh, but this, if we could look at it even closer, maybe we would see eggs where the queen had started to lay. And this is great. This is what we wanna see this time of year. So if I were to feed too much, maybe the bees would fill this back in and then that would be defeating the purpose of the queen having room to lay. But um, since the honey is being consumed so quickly, as David mentioned, you know, we gotta be careful in February and March. We wanna keep our eyes out, make sure, make sure they have something. You don't want it to get too far gone and they'll starve during a cold snap. So there's a couple of different ways we can do this. Now, if we had hive scales on each scale, it'd be really easy to get sit in here and just you know, look online and see, see how much they weigh when they got to a critical level, go out there and put some food on. But for most of us that don't have scales under each hive, there's, there's a little less accurate, but, but good enough way. And in this case, if you get used to doing this enough, you can kind of tell when a hive is getting too light just by picking up the back end or, or the front end in this case. If, if you do it on a regular basis, you'll know what it should feel like. And if it's really heavy, you don't need to add any food to it. If it is so light that when you just barely touch it, it, it moves, then it probably needs some food. And I'm gonna run this. This is a little video, hopefully it's working. 
So see that one, that one's pretty light. I mean, I, I barely took two fingers to pick it up. All right, so this one, this one, even though it's a double deep, you expect it to be a little bit heavier. If there was no food in there, it would still be easy to move. And that one was actually quite hard to pick up at all. So I fed the one on the left and the one on the right, I didn't feed. Okay. Um, there is one other thing we can do, although I'm probably gonna contradict what David just said. He said, don't crack the propolis, but if it's, if it's warm enough, he said you could. And this is the one other thing that I think is a good idea starting off now and especially as we get into February, just to go ahead and check the how big the cluster is. You know, on a, on a warm enough day with the bees have started to fly and just take a really quick peek. And by that, I don't, I don't mean, you know, pulling up frames or I don't need to see if there's a queen or anything. I just wanna see what the size of the cluster is. And this can also help determine how much to feed them. So I don't overfeed them. So if it's like just a, a little ball of bees like this, I'll feed them less than if it's a full basketball size cluster. So, uh, once again, this is a little video. So just pop it open, take a really quick peek. Look pretty good. This is obviously just a nuke, so there's only five frames across. But I think that looks pretty good. I'm happy. And that only took about 10 seconds. And from that, I could see that there's at least, I'm gonna say about seven frames of bees, maybe four in the bottom, three in the top. Now I need to pick it up and see how heavy it is and see if they need food. But if it does need food, I'm gonna give it a, enough for seven frames of bees. Whereas if there was nothing in the bottom and only two frames up top, I would feed it a lot less. And um, then the other thing that you have already covered, David, is to don't, just because it gets warm, like February, I think is one of the worst months for losing bees to starvation because I think it's here in North Carolina it warms up and maples are blooming and bees are flying and everything seems great and then we get that other cold snap that comes in and just because there's so many bees in there and they eat so quickly that's a really key time to watch out because we can lose a lot of bees to starvation but other than that that that's about all we can be doing for this this time of year although you can always build some more frames and more boxes. Oh, that's great, Jen. There's uh, questions flying in like crazy, um, but we'll we'll try and get to, to as many as we can during the Q and A session. Just one though, because um, uh, I think there was uh, Jeff here was asking if small hive beetles are a problem during the winter. So you know, make sure you describe what small hive beetles are for kind of the the new beekeepers and whatnot, and you know how much that should be. Um, well, how, how much of a problem are they during the winter cluster? Uh, well, I don't think that's truly known. They are definitely present. And I just saw some last week, I was for a research project sampling bees. So I had to go into the cluster and disturb some of the bees and they, the beetles were right under there. And the problem with the beetles are the larvae the larval stage, not the adults. And so that's what I'm seeing right now are the little black beetles running all around, but that's not what causes the problem, well, that we think of, that we know of. We're not, like I said, there's a lot not known about this right now, but they are present. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure what to tell you to do about them, but they're present. Okay, that's, so to be vigilant, but not to be too concerned, right? Um, I think that's, that's what I'm hearing. So, all right, well, we'll try and get to, don't, don't go anywhere, Jen. Um, okay. That was really great, um, but we'll, we'll uh, try to answer as many of the questions that we have um, on, the, on the YouTube channel. But for now, I want to make sure that we go to our third segment here and our uh, special guest, which is our very own Don Hopkins, who's our uh, North Carolina state apiarist uh, of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Um, and Don is uh, um, in an enviable position of leading the, what is the envy of the entire nation as far as the regulatory um, infrastructure 
of uh, apiary inspectors where we have six full-time apiary inspectors um, and most other states, you know, if they have one, they only have like one, you know, or half of one position or something like that. And so, um, Don, it's great to have you here. Um, I, I want to also uh, start out by, by asking and pointing out that even though uh, you and, and many of the other inspectors who are here tonight are in the NCDA, that is separate from North Carolina State University, and those things are often confused. Yeah. Um, so can you please describe what the Apiary Inspection Service <laughs> really does through the, the Department of Agriculture and what your main mission is? Well, our, our main mission uh, does parallel what you do. Uh, you know, uh, we are trying to see that, that the bees that uh, come into and, and are thriving in North Carolina are doing just that, thriving. Um, you know, there are bee diseases and, and everybody is all too aware of the fact that we've got pests that affect honeybees. And uh, our, our mission is to minimize the uh, problems that, that beekeepers face in, in regards to diseases and pests. So, uh, you know, I, and I, I, I thank you for mentioning the fact that we are a, a, a pretty solid group here in North Carolina. Uh, we've got six inspectors. Uh, actually, we're down one, but uh, we are hiring. We have uh, a, a tentative uh, replacement for Greg Ferris, who retired last September, and she will be starting in, uh, well, about the middle of March to the beginning of April is her start time. So we're looking forward to getting back up to full speed. That's no, that's really great. Um, I had mentioned uh, earlier in, in uh, the, the fact that people who want to sell nukes yeah. or even packages or queens, really any, any live biological material when it comes to honeybees right. need to have a permit and go through you. So can you explain yeah. that process um, from the supplier side as well as their customers? Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, logistical alterations to our permit to sell uh, function. Uh, this year, if you were on our permit, to, th this goes to the sellers right now that I'm speaking about. If you are on our permit to sell list last year, you should have received in the mail, snail mail, a copy of the 2021 uh, application to reapply. Um, if you are a new uh, potential seller, or if you are, uh, if you have not received that, um, get up with, if you know your inspector, get up with whoever that may be, or get up with myself, and uh, we will uh, sort of walk you through the process. The people that have received their uh, uh, applications in the mail are pretty much aware of what to do. They send their check in and everything's fine. If you're starting over again, or, or uh, if you're brand new this year, um, get up with your local inspector. We will inspect your colonies. Don't send the check in yet. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure you, we walk you through the process and uh, we'll carry the check in to Raleigh uh, for you. That's, that's essentially the difference. There's around, for the buyer, there's about 140 uh, participants last year. So uh, we, we strongly advise using that list to uh, make your purchases from. Uh, you, you mentioned, David, in your talk about the advantages of uh, nukes, for example. Yeah. And uh, yes, they are. However, they also do carry uh, some of the, uh, the, the, a greater likelihood of carrying some of the uh, problems that we're having to face. And so uh, one of the other aspects to our uh, program is that uh, they will be inspected from the state from which they come and or including uh, an inspection from us before they get distributed to to the buyers right so like so because they have comb they have food they can carry brood diseases and other things that are just part to it but 
going through you and buying from that list, they have to be inspected in order to make sure that they're not kind of um, egregiously selling kind of diseased, you know, hives yeah. or something, right? <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, so that's uh, exactly why going through that list and, and that helps keep the population healthier, exactly. And I, and I have to say, in conjunction with uh, uh, what you're suggesting with the uh, field days and splitting uh, colonies, uh, yep. it'd be great to have uh, the inspectors participate in as many of them as we can. And uh, we can kind of yep. just check out what's, what's being uh, distributed. Now, I didn't, I didn't want to speak for you, but I do agree that that would be awesome. And I, you also notice that I say, give them away, not sell them. Therefore, you know, yeah. uh, not to have to get their own permit in that. Uh, if they wish to, that, that's perfectly fine I, as well. Again, that, that's, that's an advice. not a, Right. Not Ex a... Exactly. Exactly. Now, I just very quickly pulled up your um, Apier Inspection homepage here um, on, again, the plant industry division yeah. of the NCDA. Um, and the, this is a map of North Carolina and uh, the various counties and the various regions for, uh, again, the, the six different inspectors. Yeah. Um, many of them are, are on this call. I know that Lewis is on the call, John is on the call, um, and Adolphus yep. uh, on the coast. Do you want to just quickly introduce them or introduce yourselves? Uh, yeah, please, if you are out there. Okay, I see John. John is in the lower southeastern portion of the state. Um, basically, everything south of, pretty much south of Fayetteville. Am I right, John? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's starting of Bladen at the top, going out to Carteret, and down south to Columbus County. And then I, I saw that Adolphus is on somewhere. He's, he's north of John. Yep, that's that's it. Dolphus, are you? Um, yes. Yeah, hello. Yep, that's me in the northeast, uh, north central uh, corner. Yep. Franklin, all the way to uh, Pamlico County, and everything in between to and the Virginia moving, line. Moving west, I I cover the northern uh, Piedmont area, and I. Don't know whether or not Nancy is uh, on board today, or she may be. She may be uh, YouTubing instead of uh, getting a, her, her. Where she lives is not the easiest place to uh, get a good signal. But uh, just south of me and and uh, west of John is Nancy's foothills region of the state, the Sand Hills rather. That's, that's, that's Nancy Rupert's territory. The new territory, or I like to call it the 77 corridor there, or the foothills portion, that's, that's our, going to be um, our, our newer inspector. And as I said, she will be starting at the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, so she'll be introducing herself. Her name is Bridget Gross. She comes from, hails from, uh, from Ohio. And she'll be starting again uh, this spring. And then Lewis will be taking up uh, all of the western counties. And I, I think, Lewis, you are here somewhere. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, essentially from Kings Mountain uh, north to Boone and everything west. And I work out of Rutherford County. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks uh, for all of you being on there. And it's really great that. Um, uh, you are having that uh, other position filled so that you just continue with the, the, the same strong cohort and team that you have. You, you mentioned, Don, that, you know, because there is a lot of confusion um, uh, between NC State and, and the NCDA, even though we have uh, very different missions, we work very, very well together, uh, again, with the same goal of trying to keep, um, you know, the, the, the health of the honeybee population, you know, healthy and thriving. Um, you know, I think, you know, you guys travel tens and thousands of miles every single year, each one of you going around and kind of being the, the clinicians, the boots on the ground and, you know, doing hive inspections and providing, um, you know, sagely advice and, and experience. 
um, we're much more um, kind of trying to investigate new tools and new solutions to the many problems that we have. But that's why we work so well together is because um, we can't do it all, right? And so I think having that good division of labor um, in kind of the, the research and extension, whereas you guys are kind of the extension and the regulatory, I think works really, really well. Um, what do you think would happen, um, you know, to the, the honeybee population kind of without that type of oversight, you know, um, just well, what are your thoughts? I've, I've seen it in other parts of the country and in other states. Um, it's not a pretty sight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, I agree. Again, uh, uh, we're really fortunate to have that, uh, that sort of cooperative uh, yeah. situation going on with us. And yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. You know, but that, it, that isn't to say that, you know, bees in North Carolina and others um, aren't without uh, problems. Oh, really? what, what is kind of the state of the state as far as kind of 2020 and some of the trends that you and the other inspectors have been seeing with respect to disease and some of these other things that you keep close tabs on? Well, uh, the good news is our, our American fowl brood situation, uh, we've been able to keep it very low. Uh, we, we do pick it up occasionally, but uh, for the most part, uh, we're able to keep it uh, extre exceedingly low, below 1% per year. Um, uh, the Varroa mite, of course, right now is, is the number one threat to beekeepers and obviously to the bees. Um, we do have management tools for that. Uh, and we are also working with some of the researchers to make sure that those tools are still effective and functional. Uh, you know, there's some concern about uh, one of the most recent ones developing resistance. And so we are assisting the people in Baton Rouge in, in trying to determine how extensive that is or how uh, likely it is to to uh, become more of a problem. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the other brood diseases that, that seem to be rearing their head every now and then, like the European fowl brood, uh, we're working with, with you guys and sort of developing some methodologies to uh, uh, see if we can come up with a, a, a simpler and more determinative way of, of uh, seeing what's going on with with EFB and the Melissococcus pluton situation. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of overlap of symptoms when it comes to those brood diseases, right? So I think it can, especially for um, kind of beginner beekeepers or or those that haven't had a lot of experience, that can really kind of throw you. With, you, th you think you have a minor problem when it's very serious or, a, you, you know, it's, it's a serious problem and you don't realize, you know, how serious it is. So, um, yeah, I think having um, that reassurance of being able to, to call you guys now, <clears throat> because um, there's only kind of one inspector for each of those regions, you know, uh, you guys must get booked out pretty, pretty far in advance, right? You're not just on call and you can show up at a moment's notice, right? So what are your um, suggestions to folks to, to get up with you and, and how to schedule an on-site visit? Well, yeah, it, it is a little bit tricky at this time of year because you never know what the next day is. I don't know. I guess it's supposed to snow tomorrow. Um, but, uh, yeah, if, if you know that you've got a problem, we want to try and address it as rapidly as possible. Uh, as far as the uh, selling or permits to sell and, and moving bees, um, we try to do them uh, as they come up. Um, if, if you're selling bees, we'll probably will start with the people that are a little bit new to it uh, and try and get them done. The people that are on our list currently, uh, we've seen them before, so we know what they're doing. And uh, so we'll, we'll uh, make sure that they get done as well. But uh, we're, we're going to prioritize 
people who have what might be in their minds, at least, if, if not a real crisis. So. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, you kind of have to triage some of that, right? I mean, I think yeah. it's, uh, and yeah. it's not easy. So I, I only bring that up is because I want to make sure that people don't have the expectation that you're on, on call, um, that you are in very high demand, all, all of you. Um, this is our busiest time of year, the next two yeah. months. Will be the yeah, busiest. you bet. Yeah. Well, um, we're already at, at 7.45, so I'm just going to open it up. And, and Don um, and Jen and, and everybody else here on, on the Zoom call, feel free to, to chime in. But we've had a ton of questions flying in. So apologies to, to anybody. We're, we're not going to be able to, to get to all of them at, at all. Uh, but I'll um, just kind of just kind of randomly pick some of these as as I see them on the on the YouTube chat. Again, thank you and, and keep uh, keep typing them in. Um, one was that I, I kind of glossed over the pros and cons of starting a new colony from a, a five frame nuke versus a package bee uh, packaged bees. And I mentioned that uh, the package bees take takes a little slower to build up. And so you probably shouldn't expect a honey crop um, if you're starting a new colony from packaged bees. Somebody want to kind of reinforce that or kind of underscore what I was saying there? Or do, first of all, do you agree? <laughs> um, and, uh, um, you know, what do you think? Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> I, I would agree that yes, they are are a quicker start, but I, I would throw that caveat in that I did earlier. The, the nukes about. are a quicker start. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I mean, I, I've seen plenty of people kind of make a honey crop in their first year from package. So there's when it comes to beekeeping, there is zero absolutes, <laughs> <laughs> except that you know they have six legs. It's about the only absolute you know that that you have, um, but uh i think that um in general they're a little more forgiving nukes are a little more forgiving um that they'll build with up all the a little queen bit issues we're having with packages right. you have problems with queen issues and nukes. Yeah. that's one of the big advantages as well so expand on that jen we're actually doing a lot of research in that area but what what is it about you know 25 percent of package queens need to be replaced or are themselves replaced right um by, by right. the bees and we, we don't understand why, but it, it has become an issue with packages that the queens either don't make it initially or they are accepted, start laying, and then get replaced pretty quickly. And so for that reason, the nukes, the queen, those queens are already accepted laying, bees recognize them, and so there shouldn't be the big problem there. But we, we don't understand what the problem is with packages, but there is some type of an issue. And it's not the queens because they've been tested and they're good. It's just mm -hmm. some fluke. <laughs> so there's some other um, questions here. There's some people are kind of hard on themselves saying that they, they think that they're bad beekeepers because they mistimed how, how to make splits. <laughs> um, don't ever do that. Uh, part of beekeeping is the humility of it, right? <laughs> you can do everything right as a beekeeper and still things go wrong because it is a wild natural system in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think I'll kind of combine a couple of these questions here about um, what is the proper timing of making splits. And again, we'll probably cover this the next time or the time after on Apiculture Online. Um, but just very quickly, um, you know, what is the best time? What is the best way to make a split? And, and why would you do it? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I will, I'll jump in. I'll say I like to do it. Whenever you, you gotta wait till you see drones, first of all, if you're gonna rear your own queens. Yeah. And queens are hard to come by in early spring, so that's probably the best way to do it. So I'm gonna say like mid-March to April, but it really depends on the, the year. Some years yeah. you can do it in first of March, and some years you have to wait till mid-April. So you gotta wait for it to be warm consistently. And so is there such a thing as over splitting? <laughs> like how 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 much do you know to like just one split or do you split it 10 different ways to make sure they don't swarm? So what's that balance there? Lewis, were you gonna chime in there? 
Oh, I was just going to say, as far as timing goes, I like to see at least six frames of ease and brood. It's kind of my – that's a good time to split, especially during the um, swarm season. It, you can – you can the bees are very forgiving in the spring, and you can make a lot of mistakes and get by with it uh, in the spring. Uh, yeah. When you get to July, not so much. Yeah. So if you think the way I think about it is, is always think about it from the biology of, of the bees. When you make a split, you're in essence swarming for them. Right. right? Yeah. And so it's a great way to deter the bees from swarming on their own by swarming it, swarming them on your, on your terms. Right. Um, the downside is that you just need a queen to put in the other half <laughs> so that, you know, both halves can, can keep going. Um, but if you have a really, really strong colony and, um, you know, you can sometimes make more than one split from it uh, to, to keep them from from swarming. Uh, but, yeah, you don't want to um, divide them too many ways because then they, they they still need that critical mass to be able to recover and to and to to continue. Right. Yeah. But the other thing I see people do is splitting uh, too thin, trying to make their own queens. Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of nurse bees to make a good queen. That's and correct. so if that, if you just give a, a nuke uh, two frames of bees and brood and ask them to make a queen, they might do it, but it's not going to be a quality queen. You really need a lot of nurse bees to, to do that heavy lifting. So if, if you already have a capped queen cell, uh, you can make that two frame split and you'll mm-hmm. still get a good queen. But if you're asking the bees to start from ground zero, um, that's not going to be a good plan yeah yeah david i tell you what and a lot of people try to split them too early and Mm -hmm. if we get late we are really prone to late frost and cool spells like we had last year good point Um, i have ticker beekeeper he thought he had foul brood and it was just chilled brood because he tried to split them too thin there wasn't enough bees to keep the brood warm and the brood got chilled yep yep and it's just one of those simple things that you know, it's a learning experience, but yeah. you know, if you split them too thin before the honey flow, you don't have that mass of extra bees that you need to bring in a honey crop. And our honey crop only lasts about six weeks uh, in my location. So right. it's uh, that's all those factors you have to keep in mind. No, that's a great point. And, and again, this is why, you know, it can be difficult because you can't predict the weather necessarily, you know, if you need to think one to two brood cycles out, you can't predict the weather six weeks from now, you know? (laughs) So a a lot of that, um, you just, uh, you know, use your best judgment and, 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 and predictions of, of what you think the bees will need going forward in that way. Um, there's uh, another comment here, a very good comment about how somebody went in uh, uh, today because it was warm enough. It was 55 degrees or so, and they quickly went in and they reduced the, the, the colonies down. They reduced the hives down, and they said they probably saved four hives doing that. Um, so can somebody explain that process of, of reducing the hive down, uh, helping the bees make it through the winter? I'm, I'm presuming that uh, they had more space than they needed, uh, so it probably got the the food, hopefully immediate abo- above the cluster, yep. um, and all of the brood, I would presume, did not get too much disturbed, in, in, and yep. uh, just give them a little more cozy space, and that will help to some degree if and when the beetles start to uh, take up. The, 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 the beetles oftentimes will try to get in front of the bees so you don't want that yeah it's just like ourselves right you don't want um a huge house that you have to heat and you know patrol and 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 take care of if the colony is that big you don't want a hive that big right you want the the hive to be an appropriate size for the cluster and so that there's been some attrition over the last few months and you know you can go in you can um, put all of the bees and the brood and all the food all together and get rid of all that extra space the bees will be much better off for it they'll be much stronger coming out of winter that way um, than than they would otherwise so yeah that's 
a good comment and a good a good point. Um, good beekeeping practice there. Again, sorry for missing all the stuff that um, uh, all the questions here. I'm not going to be able to get through through all of them. Uh, let me see if there's others. There's a question here about concerns about Africanized bees coming into North Carolina. Um, that is very much on the regulatory radar of the NCDA. So, Don, um, do you want to talk about the North well, Carolina action plan for Africanized bees? It was just a week ago, Adolphus and I were down in Wilmington checking the, uh, the uh, trap hives that we've got, trap boxes that we've got there, not, not presuming that there were bees in them yet, but just to make sure that they had not gotten knocked down or blown over. Um, and, and they will be baited shortly. And, and uh, that, that the two port cities, we've been doing that for a number of years. Um, this is also why when we're purchasing, when we're bringing bees in from out of state, uh, we check them. Uh, and if their behavior is such that uh, it merits uh, further investigation, uh, we'll, we'll bring a sample to our lab and, and do the morphometric measurements at our, at our office. Uh, Adolphus, you have your hand up um, about that, or was that a pre from a previous question? Uh, that was a um, previous question. So okay. Move on. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I, I wasn't uh, um, attentive enough to, to seeing the hand raise and scanning these, these questions. Uh, so, uh, so it was hard to, to see that. Um, yeah, I also see that Nancy uh, answered on the on the chat as well about the Africanized action plan. So the, it is very much an issue, um, and the ports is one of the main ways, but also potentially, you know, uh, migratory, you know, trucks coming up and human assisted transport of the Africanized bees. So it's definitely something to to keep an eye out. Um, let's see. Other questions here. So there's uh, another one here about um, uh, best way to transition deep frame nukes to median frames. <laughs> that's a that's actually a very interesting question about if you buy a five frame nuke and they're with deep frames, but your own beekeeping operation has medium frames because they're easier to lift or for whatever reason. The bees don't care what the size of the frames are, but how do you transition them going from those deep frames, which are not going to fit in your hive equipment, to uh, your more uh, to your medium frames? Any advice on that? I actually have uh, an answer to that, which is to reach out to whoever you're going to buy your nukes from and see if they will provide medium nukes especially um, local bee stores and things like that who are providing nukes very often offer a medium nuke option, but you have to give them plenty of time to know that that's going to be what you need because they have to build those frames out for you specifically. Yeah, that's a good point, Aaron. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, folks, especially if they're kind of local, it's uh, something that you can set up. And again, a little proactive asking of questions, um, that's, that's a good way to do it. Let's say you didn't realize the difference and you, you know, have all the, the medium frames and you bought uh, deep frames, what would be a suggestion there? You could, you could super them with, with your, the equipment that you currently have and, and just let the bees move up into it and then pull the lower box out further on into the season. Yeah, I think also another way to, to do that is you um, make sure that the queen goes into, once they've built out the, the, the medium combs, make sure the queen's up there and then you can put a queen excluder in between the two so she doesn't go back down into the deep equipment and then it'll all hatch out and then it'll all be empty and then you can remove those. Um, so it'll, it'll take a little while, a little, little, little coaxing, but certainly I think something's possible. Well, uh, believe it or not, we're already at the hour. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think we'll just have to leave the, the questions there. Sorry, we weren't able to, to get to everybody's questions, but um, thanks again for joining. Again, as a reminder, we're gonna be doing this monthly 
Um, and so it's going to be the last Wednesday of every month. And so the next Apiculture Online is going to be February 24th. And uh, our guest interviewee is going to be uh, Muhammad Al-Baraki, who is a relatively new research scientist at the USDA lab in Beltsville. And he's done some some really nice work kind of, kind of at the landscape level on bee health and um, interactions of pesticides and diseases and all sorts of things. Um, and so it's uh, going to be real, real nice to have him as our, uh, our guest interviewee. Uh, but until then, I want to thank Don uh, again and Jennifer for uh, presenting today, as well as for your attendance. Uh, thank you again and hopefully see you next month.